So, um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Abbey Room here at the Boston Public Library. Uh, my name is David Leonard. I'm the Director of Administration here. And um, the weather took us a little bit by surprise today, so hopefully it doesn't become too much warmer in here over the, ne over the next hour, but please bear with us. I will make a few brief opening remarks and then introduce Ron Drucker, who will then introduce today's distinguished lecturer. The Drucker Lecture Series, Celebrating Urban Design and Architecture, was established by the Drucker family in 2001. This acclaimed annual public lecture focuses on the understanding and appreciation of design and architecture in the urban environment. Speakers are selected for their outstanding and important contributions to the world of urban art and architecture, and the Boston Public Library is privileged to be the host for this series, supported by the generosity of the Drucker family. I would also like to, to thank Beth Prindle and members of the library staff for putting together today's lecture in coordination, coordination with the Drucker team. Ron Drucker is a distinguished leader in the real estate, architecture, and design communities. His family has had a relationship across many generations with the Boston Public Library, dating at least back to the design of the original Orient Heights branch in East Boston. This relationship was made all the stronger with the conceiving and the beginning of this lecture series, which dates back to 2001. So on behalf of President Ryan and the Board of Trustees, I would like to thank Ron and his family for their continued support and for an ever-strengthening relationship. So without further ado, I would now like to ask Ron to introduce today's guest speaker. Please join me in welcoming Ron Drucker to the podium. Uh, th thanks, David, and Amy couldn't be here, but Beth is here, so I want to thank Amy, Beth, David, and the whole staff of the BPL for organizing this. Um, the concept of endowing this lecture series really came from wanting to celebrate 100 years of development activity of my family uh, in the city, and that was started uh, in 2001 from 1901. And um, the real goal was to expose to the public through the Boston Public Library world-class designers and architects. And the name of the program is the lecture series in architecture and design. So from time to time, we've also had, no one has come, but we've had conversations with fashion designers and industrial designers and, and other people uh, of renown. This year, we are really privileged to have uh, Daniel Liebskin, uh, who is a, a friend. Uh, as a former client, unfortunately, our building didn't get built on the Greenway uh, through no fault of, of Daniel's. Um, and one of the, the great privileges I had in working with Daniel is that I visited uh, the Jewish Museum in Berlin, um, the um, just Imperial War Museum in Manchester, uh, and the Felix Nussbaum Museum in Osnabrück, Germany. All of them w were a privilege, and they were, because it's a while ago, they were relatively early works. And Daniel, I don't know if you're going to show any of those works, but Daniel will be showing work uh, that has gone far beyond that. Uh, Daniel was a musical prodigy uh, who gave up music for architecture. Uh, his work is completely international today. Um, and uh, he has the ability to do many different product types not just museums, not just concert halls, not just apartments, not just shopping centers, not just hotels, uh, which I think is interesting because some designers are pigeonholed, whereas Daniel Liebskin certainly is not. Um, he's also well recognized for doing something very significant for our country, uh, which is doing the master planning for Ground Zero, 
uh, which was a complicated, long, uh, and emotional process uh, for us all, but certainly Daniel was in the middle of it. Uh, as a, uh, and I would like to think current client, even though uh, unrequited by us, not Daniel, uh, unfulfilled, um, Daniel's a, 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 a special designer, uh, as I said last night when we had a dinner, uh, who is willing to really listen to the client and design to, to the client's needs. Um, and with that, I introduce Daniel Liebskin, and we're honored to have you. Thank you so much, uh, Rand, and thanks to all my friends and uh, the public library. This is really an example of incredible architecture and the civic pride and the meaning that architecture has. I think it was Ted Cruz, a uh, famous Republican, just a few days ago said, it's a waste of time to study art history, which is astonishing because when you come here, there's so much to learn. And I entitled this lecture, The Language of Places, because places speak to us. You know, they're not, they're not unlike people. They have a heart, they have a soul. They sometimes whisper something to us, but they do speak to us. And every place where I have been, privileged to be, one has to listen. Sometimes the voices are obscure, and yet they do speak to us about the future and about history. So let me share with you a few things that I wanted to say. First of all, the importance of the hand. Now, we live in a world of miracles, of technology, but I've always believed that everything does start with the hand. Now, of course, the hand is a symbol also for the mind, for, for ability to make something. And, you know, I started architecture not by building buildings. You know, for many years I drew, and I didn't have clients. And what is an architect to do who has no clients? He, he can only draw. But the drawing is not something hollow and not something ridiculous because out of the structures of a drawing, and these are large series of drawings which are now in the Museum of Modern Art and other important museums, I created a kind of a, a connection to places which were to be and also were through different uh, modes of discourse that have to do with, with hands. I also created machines uh, in different modes. This was a kind of medieval uh, reading machine which I constructed, a memory machine, a homage to the great Renaissance mystics like Giordano Bruno and Campanella, the writing machine to Jonathan Swift and all the people I admired who created a kind of impetus for mechanisms. And so I went on and I was able also to create uh, scenography, costumes, uh, certainly Wagner is not an uncontroversial figure in my life, but to create something in the world of opera and to be able actually to direct an opera. I, didn't, I was asked to, be, to conduct this opera by the Deutsche Opera, but you know, as Messiaen is a very complex composer, I would have to, have to take at least two years to just study the score because it's in volumes and volumes. But I, outside of conducting, I, I really, really directed, uh, did the scenography, uh, the acting of St. Francois de Assis, a fantastic opera, by the way, inspired by Wagner, maybe even longer than a Wagnerian opera, but something really inspiring. He created even his own instruments. So, and later on, I, I got involved in exhibitions. This was a very complex exhibition, a Moscow-Berlin exhibition, uh, which was the largest uh, exhibition ever in Berlin. It was visited by more people uh, than any other exhibition in 1995 when all the works of Soviet art and Nazi art were shown in Berlin, showing the end of the Cold War. And I created these extreme spaces within the Mart Martin Gropiusbau historical building in Berlin to show the fatality of dictatorships and also the kind of art which mirrored these ideologies in a very, very interesting... So again, exhibition, music, scenography, drawing... And beyond that, you know, making things. Uh, you know, this was a large interactive w work I did with students uh, of business at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland to create totemic understanding of a city which the students were able to create through a program. And I also design, you know, this is, it happens to be a, a tea set 
uh, but, but many other things that I've been involved in in recent years because that's all part of architecture. Even chairs for the crystal at the Ram Royal Ontario Museum in, in, in Toronto and even objects uh, like sculptures, the Garden of Love and Fire where I created canals in the polder lands of, of Holland and large monument in Wazoo in, in, in Japan, on, on the Sea of Japan that, that climbs up and, and is kind of dedicated to poetry and Japanese culture. So, and beyond that, of course, it's very important to think of social ideas. This is not just for those who enjoy culture, but this is housing in Sri Lanka for the victims of the tsunami, very low-cost housing, which I created. And that's also part of my idea, architecture idea, that it is also a social, ethical mission to create for those who really need so let me now come to a few ideas that, that I, I would say I'm obsessed with. Idea of memory. You know, without memory, we would not be human. This is what distinguishes human beings from any other animal. Uh, it's memory. It's the, the ability to understand that the past is a light onto the future. And I share with you my first project because, you know, like Dante in the Divine Comedy, he says, in the middle of my life, I entered the forest. And that's exactly what happened to me. I'd never built anything before this building. And that was probably even past the midpoint of my life. And you, you can see the Star of David, the Jewish Museum in Berlin. It was not called Jewish Museum when I started on it. It was supposed to be a Berlin museum with a small department, Abteilung, Jüdische Abteilung. But you know, being a child of survivors of the Holocaust and having been born and lived in Poland under communism and antisemitism, I understood that you could not create an uptilung about Jewish culture. That the division of East Ber and West Berlin, you see that line on top, that's the wall. And I didn't care about the East-West division. I care about the fact that when it came to Jewish culture, it was about Europe, it was about Germany, about extermination, and about what would happen to the city. So even though I, I won the competition in 1989, before the wall fell down, went through many different changes of government, names of the museum, clients for the museum, ideas what to do with it. I'm glad to say that this museum not was, was not only built, but became a, a, a frequently visited museum. And it's not a museum built for the Jews. The majority, 99% of the visitors are not Jewish. They come from Germany, they come from neighboring countries. To learn the story of what happened to the city and to the world, what does it mean to exterminate a culture? What does it mean to have a life after that? What happens? Is there hope? And I think there is. You can see that the two buildings, the old Baroque building and the new building, have no obvious connections. Uh, I thought there is no connection. Every, you know, it's an international competition, anonymous, by the way, out of the 200 architects. I was the only one who proposed no bridge between the buildings because I thought that there is no direct bridge between the Baroque and today that you have to go underground because the enlightenment, to understand the enlightenment, the burning of Jewish books, that, that antisemitism developed already back in the 17th, 18th century. You have to explore the underground of Berlin. And by the way, the stones of Jewish cemeteries were used to pave the subways of Berlin. I don't know whether you know that, but that's part of the drama of entering a space that has a kind of tripartite overture. There are three roads that, that, that you encounter a road to a dead end, which is a dead end of Berlin as we have always known it. It's, it's a new Berlin after that time. It's, there, there's no Berlin of that, of that old kind anymore. Then there is the road to the Garden of Exile because Berlin is forever also exiled from its old Berlin. And people are exiled from Berlin also. And the culture is exiled. And also a road leading very vulnerably to the continuity of history. And, and the road of dead end... I created a, 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 a structure which is, which is the void. It's, 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 a, it's a Holocaust tower. It has no other meaning than to stab the heart with a sharp point of light. It, it is not heated in the winter. It's not cooled in the summer. You can just hear vaguely beyond the concrete walls a tumult of life beyond. And yet this light, this sharp point. And I have to tell you the story, if I might take you to a little anecdote. For many years, you know, I started the museum in many years before, and I worked on it for a long time. I never had a light here. It was a dead end. It was a tower of blackness. There is no hope in the Holocaust, I thought. There is not, what, what light can you bring to it? But then I read an, an account of a survivor uh, from one of the concentration camps in Yafa Elyach's beautiful book, The Holocaust, uh, Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust, in which she describes the survivor. She said, I was locked into the car 
I was taken to Stutthof or wherever it was, and I looked, and I don't know whether she looked through a crack of the car or through the crack of the mind, but she said, I saw a white line, and I held to that white line all my life, and I survived. And I believe I survived because I held on to that light, line of light. Later on, I thought maybe this was just a plume of airplane smoke or something completely insignificant, and yet I put that line because there has to be hope. Without it, the history would have no meaning. Uh, the, the, the Garden of Exile is a very unusual garden. It's, it, the vegetation grows beyond your reach. It's in columns. There are 49 columns. Uh, they are filled with the earth of Berlin, the central one, with the earth of Israel, 1948 creation of the state of Israel, and the vegetation grows, and, and you get a sense also of ascendance upwards. You don't go through a big atrium. You don't end up in, a, in some sort of redemptive space, but you end up in a kind of this an unfolded map of the star of Berlin that connects various addresses. And I have to say, this museum does not have great collections, does not have many masterpieces, and yet it is one of the most visited museums in all of Germany. So people are attracted to a, a, a story that can be told through, through, through metal, through stone, through concrete, through the voids, through the echoes. And by the way, I used para-architecture methods. You know, I wanted to complete an opera by Schoenberg. Because Arnold Schoenberg, if you know, wrote the opera Moses and Aaron in Berlin. He didn't complete the third act. He couldn't. He left. He was kicked out. And I thought, you know, this act cannot be completed musically. It can only be completed in the echoes of the footsteps of the visitors across the void of Berlin. And indeed it is. If you listen to that space, you hear that star, you hear it, it resonate in a new Berlin. Of course, it's a Berlin of, 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 it's a new city. It's a city with great potential. I was later able to build in the Baroque courtyard the glass court, a kind of sukkah, because originally they said there will be no people there for dinners, for celebrations, for, for social life, but the Jewish community has grown. Berlin has grown, and this, this space is a very important social space for the museum. And across the street, I was able recently to complete the academy, the learning, the Jewish Learning Academy. Uh, there are thousands of people who want to learn about what happened to their city, what happened to in those dark times. And it's a part of the old Blumenhalle, the old flower market across the street built in the 60s. And I created these kind of moving boxes that penetrate. And on the outside, I created my own work. The, I also sponsored it. Actually, Nina said, that's a good idea. Museum doesn't have enough money, but we can sponsor it. It's, it's a quote of Maimonides, Moses Maimonides, written around 1200. It was written in Judeo-Arabic, and I put it in Judeo-Arabic, Arabic, Hebrew, German, and English. And it said, hear the truth, whoever speaks it. It's a fantastic thought of a, of a genius. Hear the truth, whoever speaks it. So that's the Jewish Museum in Berlin. That's my first project. And, uh, you know, sometimes you do a project, and it's not really that large. It's not a big museum, but yet it has an impact on people's psyche. So it's not just about the size of a project. It's what a spiritual link a project can make with a human soul. Overture. I was a musician, as you heard. And, uh, you know, I, I, even though I won the, you know, the, the prize together with it's like Perelman, Daniel Berenbaum, the previous year, and Isaac Stern, who was the head of the jury, told me I was the only person who did not become famous in music. I never feel that I've really given up music because architecture is very close to music. And I was actually building, when I was building the Dublin Performing Arts Center, really the hall, uh, on the Docklands in Dublin, I had a chance to create actually a musical space. You know, the Docklands were an abandoned place. And through a public-private partnership, I was able to create a building that the city could afford just before the collapse of Irish economy. So these large office buildings, now occupied by Facebook and one of the largest law firms in Ireland, uh, really were an impetus to create, and I you know, created, actually kind of works within the atriums. That's, by the way, the, the, the words of God that James Joyce wrote in Finnegan's Wake. There are 1,001 1, lettered words. He believed he derived from all languages into these lengthy I thought it was interesting, upside down, mirrored in the offices. But anyway, the, this building really has renovated the, the ship canals, very abandoned area, has brought life back, hotels, office buildings, residential. And the trick, I think, and that's what I want to communicate, public-private partnership is to create something that people can afford. It's not a trick to create a big musical space. Uh, the, one, the one is being built in Germany, costs almost a billion euro. This building costs $60 million, and it's a building for 2,200 people. 
creating a plaza. I worked with Martha Schwartz, a wonderful friend, and a building that, as you can see, minimizes the footprint but creates a really large uh, infrastructure for operas, for big performances. So, again, by shrinking the footprint but not uh, devoting too much money to expensive materials like marble and chandeliers, creating a fantastic interior that, by the way, you can hear a person without a microphone from the center of that stage and creating really a, a, a connectivity for citizens of this great city that loves music and poetry and which is coming back through its, uh, its economic uh, distress. And this is really one of the great new centers of culture for the city. So again, the, the message here is that public-private partnerships work if, if architects are not interested just expanding the budgets, but can create an affordable, something affordable, and this is now used every day of the year, it's programmed, it's very successful, and it's part of the music of that city. Now, urbane is a word also I think about, because urbanity is something we should always appreciate. And Boston is such a beautiful city, and we are so lucky to live in beautiful cities. So I had a chance in a beautiful city, Dusseldorf, very sophisticated one in Germany, there was one site, as you can see on this a plan, this curvilinear, two large blocks, which I designed in a competition, less buildings on the park. You can see the Schauspielhaus, the monumental buildings, the 19th century buildings. The two sites, for, for historical reason, were never built at the end of the Königsallee, the King's Street. And I won the competition. And what is it? It's for an office and a retail. How, how do you do that? How do you create something interesting, connect to the Coburg and to the park? You can see that uh, there are very strict regulations where the buildings, the heights of buildings, where the buildings have to stand. And I created really, a, you know, a new connection to city piazzas, uh, creating large buildings. You can see these large cuts, which are still a little bit empty, but they are sculptural cuts, which have a complex water system irrigation, where, where plants will grow at all times of the year. Different colors. You can see them here. They are really large scale. They, they are visible from inside of the offices, but also on the outside. Uh, and and it's, an, it's never been done before in a building where you have vegetation over several stories growing in different seasons. Kind of like a works of art, but also adding to the sense of, of the beauty of nature in this. And I'm glad to say that Boston Consulting Group owns one of the buildings. And uh, you can see that I tried to break the scale of these large, massive blocks to give it a human scale, a European, a urban scale. And I'm also very happy that the last uh, project on which... Uh, uh, Jobs, Steve Jobs worked, was this Apple store in Dusseldorf, and it's a very beautiful store, which is part of this complex. Uh, the buildings have three upper stories, have a courtyard for the office buildings, completely enclosed courtyard with trees and with nature. The lower stories uh, are some of the large mega stores of Dusseldorf and other stores. So again, the urban connection, the urban urbanity of a place, uh, the beauty of, of, of architecture and the park, and a sense of also historical city moving forward with, with architecture that I think is exciting and has already become loved even in a city that is rather conservative. Expressive is a word architects don't like to use, and it's an embarrassing word, but I like the word expressive. You know, who doesn't like espresso? You know, that's, that's what expressive means. It means the essence of something. It's not the diluted coffee. It's the real thing. And I had a chance to work on a house uh, for a couple in Connecticut to create a house for them. Now this house stands in, in a beautiful field, Connecticut. It's a, it's, a, it's a small house, not a very large house. As you can see, it's stainless steel, completely, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a very special skin. A, the building glows with colors that are unpredictable. Sometimes it's light blue, like the sky. Every angle is different. And I had a very simple brief from my client. You know, there are art collectors that said, we don't want to have any artwork in the house. We want the house to be the artwork. We want to be inspired by the house. So that was my chance to create something really very spectacular on the outside. But on the inside, it's, there is no metal. There's nothing. It's thick oak. It's not veneer. It's, it's all wood. It's like a cave. And some of those shards of stainless steel come in, but internally, and I was able to design all the furniture and all the things and the kitchen and all the uh, things uh, are part of the intimacy of, of life. Uh, of, a, of a couple, and that's what I love to do. You know, work, I've always worked on large projects, but working with people intimately to satisfy their demands, their needs, uh, their lifestyle, and to create something that is harmonious, that is also new. 
that isn't you know, a picture of house, and it's not a white house from the Corbusier, it's not a black box or a white box. It's, it's an expressive house, and it has the kind of, you know, both cold and, and hot blood in it. You know, it's cold blood on the outside, it's hot blood on the inside. It's, it's kind of like my clients. And the house has porches, right, that extend, uh, and it's very ecological. You, you notice there's not a lot of glass in the house. It's just turned into various directions to take advantage of the light in the morning, in the winter, uh, and, and brings, I think, pleasures. And the best uh, thing that I can say for, for myself is that my clients have given us the key and said, when we are not there, you can actually be welcome still to use the house. I used it once. It's fantastic. Uh, singular. That's a word which is used by Stephen Hawking in, in science, the singularity phenomena. But I mean singular that individuality in, in high-density projects is very important. Because, uh, you know, we know we need high-density. You know, and uh, Ronald has, uh, has shown it and done it. But what do you do in Singapore, where it's one of the highest density, highest cost per square meter of space? How do you accommodate thousands of units, apartments, without making it like a cookie-cutter project? And I'm very proud with this project on the, on the old harbor also. You can see this kind of necklace of public spaces also created. On the right is the same client's project from some years before. You can see it's, it really is cookie-cutter. On the left is something rather different. And I was able to create these doubly curved towers that really rise and, and, and are spectacular because every unit is in a different position in space, the lower level villas. Uh, and I have to say I was very proud. It, you know, Singapore has many great architects from around the world. This was the most profitable project built in Singapore. And that's good for a client because you want to make projects profitable. You don't want projects to just be projects that are nice in architecture magazines. And it, it, people uh, liked it because it gave, even though it is dense, I saved a lot of space for greenery. There was a lot of space for, for amenities and also for clubhouses, cafes, places on the boardwalk, which others who are not as lucky to live there can enjoy. And really it is. My client, Keppel Corp., was very, very much you know, taking a huge kind of a gamble risk, you know, doing something that has never been done in Singapore. But they benefited because they saved so much nature. And, and in this small country, nature is, is, is precious. So there's a lot of land. And up in, the, in those towers, you have growing elements right in these doubly curved towers. And you, when you're up there with, with the greenery, there is that sense of, of really being in a fantastic space, in a fantastic city. The bridges, by the way, are amenities. They have green, they have trees, uh, they have public activities between the buildings. There are six towers and about 12 other buildings down below. And you can see that they are kind of a gateway to Santosa, to other parts of the island, very dramatic in their topography. They really are, you know, you don't need to have just a museum that is iconic or a hotel, even residential. And that's how I've always believed. That's the biggest test for architecture. It's how people live. That's how we judge cities. We don't judge cities how good a museum does a city have or how good a church or synagogue or, you know, community center. We judge a city how well do people live in this city. And I think that's part of... And then I have another project really next door, very different planning, uh, uh, corals, again. So, again, uh, importance of, of singularity, individuality, and an ambition in, 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 in housing. Political is another word architects don't like. But architecture is highly political. Everything that is built, even my small house in Connecticut, had to get permission. Neighbors had to say, what does it look like? How does it look from my house? Is it good? Is it bad? So I had a chance to create a building in Germany. And uh, you will perhaps not recognize this city. This is a painting by Bellotto, Canaletto, of Dresden, which was called the Venice of the North, one of the most beautiful cities in Europe. Incredible, spectacular a Baroque city. And then you perhaps know this picture of Dresden after the Allied bombings. Just nothing. It's just, just a sea of ruins. And of course, that, is, that, that was the end of the Nazi regime. That was the end. And by the way, to the end, the Germans fought against the Allies. Till the last day. It wasn't as if they gave up. They fought. And that's why the city was destroyed. And what a fatal city. And then I read Victor Klemperer. Please read his two volumes. He was a a German, first of all, a Jew also, an intellectual, a professor of linguistics, of German linguistics, who wrote his memoirs with his... Uh, uh, he survived, but he said he waited for the bombings. He said that was the only way for us, for me and my wife, perhaps to survive this, this nightmare. So when I had a chance to build this museum, which is the military history museum of Germany, the largest museum in Germany, military uh, history in Germany is, is big. 
from the 12th century on. You can see the building. It's, it's, it's an old armory, which was already an armory in the 19th century, became a Saxon museum, the Kaiser's museum, the Nazi museum, the Russian museum, the Soviet, the East German museum. And after unification, there was a company, what do we do with this? What do we do with this building? Uh, there's the plan. The, the armory, which I restored, the horizontal, tells the historical story in chronology. But you can see that there's a kind of a vector off-center. It interrupts that chronology exactly between 1914 and 1945, where the destruction of the world emanated from German imperialism, German militarism, and, and genocidal tendencies. And that's the museum. This, this is it. The largest museum in Germany. This is like the West Point of Germany. This is where German officers come to learn about German history. And I was glad that uh, I won the competition. All the other competitors built a building behind, behind, in the, behind the new shape. You know, we'll put the new building behind. I said, no, we ha the building has to somehow cut through and show that the military and the democracy is not behind walls. It's visible to the public. It, it must show the importance and the catastrophe of military history without a democracy. And that's what the building is. It's not just a facade. It moves through the whole opacity and cuts through the building and cuts through the historical part of the building, which is, of course, the historical armory and exhibitions, right through the columnar structure. And you can see, I just cut through the columns, a totally different structure, which is not orthogonal in any way, put the circulation right up above, brought light through it. And that very interesting exhibition, for example, Animals at War, you know, we know about the lions and, you know, and elephants of Hannibal, but we hardly think about anthrax, biological warfare, dogs, cats, birds. So the inhumanity of bringing nature into, into war can be shown in this museum, as well as, of course, the innocence of children's toys. The play, and, and you can see that on the left you see a piece of the 19th century staircase, which I saved, because a beautiful staircase, like a window onto a lost past, and then you go through these uh, oblique vitrines that are sometimes very large, and you're alarmed by not a display of armament, because it's not. It's a series of questions that are being asked. That's really the kind of anthropological moment of the museum. Why do people follow fanatical leaders? Why do people follow? Why do they march in order? Why do they salute? Why do they collaborate with violence? That's a museum of questions. No answers are given. Very difficult to give answers to these questions. But that's what you sense. And I work very closely with the exhibition designers here to create a sense of questions. And as you ascend upward, you ascend to the to exhibition which shows all the cities bombed from Dresden. You know, Vialichka in Poland, where I come from. Uh, Coventry, Rotterdam. And also, as you go out, you are out on that wedge. And the wedge is pointing you notice the point. It's not pointing to something unimportant in its form. It's pointing to the place from which Dresden was bombed in 1945. There was one coordinate point given, which was the field, and the two other points which triangulated that point. So the building, when you're in the building and you're looking on the left, you see the really incredible new skyline of Dresden rebuilt, but you're also aware that you're standing in a new city, and you're aware that the city was bombed to smithereens, and it's pointing to that point while opening itself towards the beautiful city which is being rebuilt as we speak. So that's really about history. It's about the military history and the importance of democracy and a new Germany. Now risky is a word also that uh, nobody likes, but I do like it because without risk there would be no life at all on earth or elsewhere. And when I had a chance to build the Denver Art Museum, I thought of these beautiful buildings of Gioponti, Michael Graves, all the things that are there in a beautiful city of the West. And you can see it here in, in kind of aerial view. Uh, the complex on the bottom, you can see the museum on the left and a garage and also housing, which I proposed, which developers liked and built. So, and I proposed a piazza. So it was not about just a single building, standalone building, but how do you transform this beautiful area, which was, by the way, very deserted when I started, uh, right next to a state capital, beautiful state capital. How do you really bring life through art and through people living here? So the Denver Art Museum is connected to the Gioponti building. Totally different dramatic form, ascending upward beyond the, beyond the city itself. I called it two lines going for a walk. Really folding of the kind of nature of the mountains and also of cultural 
uh, uh, sense of, of, of walking. And you can see two very different sections. On the right is the Giopanti building, more like an office building. Very beautiful, but you know, it doesn't have any public space. It doesn't have any mega exhibition spaces. This was the largest new spaces created for uh, temporary exhibitions, Western art, Oriental art, uh, African art, and, and, and new art. And I think that's what a museum should be. A museum of art should not confirm one's idea of art. It should be like art itself. It's a wonder, it's a mystery. Where is art leading us? And I was lucky to work with great patrons, to, uh, great uh, curators to create a piazza, very uh, much a museum that is unusual in many ways, but has spaces for public discourse, uh, for parties, uh, for uh, art, has definitely right-angled walls, for large uh, uh, exhibitions. And by the way, when Yves Saint Laurent exhibition ca uh, was, came to the United States, they considered New York, they considered Chicago, Los Angeles. Yves Saint Laurent decided it should go to Denver. It was only shown in Denver. So I like Yves Saint Laurent, actually. Uh, and there are walls of projection, you know, made site-specific uh, art, specific art created for these spaces by great artists, and the ever-elusive uh, point, dark point, that points you beyond the Rocky Mountains, into the future, and, and circulation spaces that bring also the drama. And by the way, is the Titanium building. I, could I ever, in my afford a Titanium? No, but the Titanium producer was on the board of the Denver Art Museum, and he gave it for free. Little did I know that the connections of Titanium are so much more expensive than those of aluminum or steel. So it was a challenge, but it is a beautiful cladding of the building. And it's a building that has certainly brought life to the center of the city. The piazza has really created an impetus for people to move here. So now there's a new museum, the Clifford Still Museum, galleries, the real estate values have gone up. It's a beautiful place to live. And I, I was able to create some of this housing, you know, cladding. On the left is the large parking garage, which was a requirement of the city. But you can see Beverly Pepper's work and, and Klaus Oldenburg. And, and the building really shining with the beauty of, of the great state capital. And uh, John Hickenlooper, the, the, the governor now, is a great, uh, was actually on the board of, of the museum. Uh, but but it's, it's a very progressive city, city that is really moving. And, and it shows that a museum is not a standalone thing. It can really help to change a, a, an area that was just cars being parked and, and just the abandoned state capital and a beautiful park and library of Michael Graves. Now, a real magnet and, and a center of the city. Metamorphosis, a word from Kafka, but it's really about transforming the city. And I had a chance here to design, I was, this is the largest competition maybe in the world, in Milan, Italy. Uh, the Fiera di Milano moved out to the suburbs and the center of Milan had a 64 acre site where I think every architect and company in the world competed. We won this competition together with Generali, the insurance company, and other companies, uh, insurance companies, together with Zaha Hadid and Arata Isozaki. I did the master plan and in the center are the three towers, Zaha on the left, Isozaki on the right, myself right in the center there, and there is the master plan. And what is the idea here? The idea is to bring green space to the center of the city. It's a very beautiful, but city full of asphalt and hardscape. So create a green piazza. Of course, put the housing on the periphery, picking up the scale of the city. In the center, the, the, the subway stop, Metropolitana. Bring the office buildings, retail, but create really a completely different model of a city in the 21st century. Not just, and uh, here you see it, in, 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 in a sort of as, as it's developing. And here's my as part, uh, you can see high density housing also. And Milan has very, uh, very high level of expectation of housing. You know, 18th century, 19th century, 20th century. Through all times, Milan has been a leading fashion center capital of design and also econ economics. So expectations are always high. On the left, you see the Park Tower, which is also one of my projects. So how do you design very large scale housing uh, with a character, a luxury, but also ecological sense of, of community, fronting the gardens both privately and publicly. And you can see it here, it's, it's a project of thousands, thousands of new units, completely new scale also in Milan, such houses. But also you can see that it fits also into the 19th century neighborhoods. There's the Art Nouveau buildings all around it, so it's low on the periphery, rises to the center of the park where the big towers are, which are office towers and hotels. And this is my project. You can see I concentrated on on, on giving these buildings a scale. The penthouses uh, are kind of like villas, and I'm glad they sold first because the, the selling of the penthouses financed the entire project, actually. 
So that's really uh, also a strategy, how to create green spaces, how to bring the car without having this dark uh, underground parking. You can see the car is right on the right. You can, you can sort of reach your uh, core. And you know, there are beautiful lobbies. I was able to design chairs and things like that and uh, create also uh, sun screening, so orient the buildings in a sustainable way. I think sustainability is really about the materials you use, sustainability, new technologies, and, and uh, also giving a sense of new light and space to the buildings. So these buildings have just opened. Uh, they're just beginning to, to, to be uh, bought and rented. But I think it's a completely new idea for a historical city. And it shows that uh, with the Park Tower, other projects, the city is moving forward. Uh, my office uh, tower, uh, which is uh, just starting construction, uh, will also contribute to that central piazza, which will be a, a really important piazza in Milan. So again, even historical cities have to compete. It's not so much nations competing, it's, it's cities that have to compete. You know, it's Berlin, it's Frankfurt, it's London, it's Paris not so much, Tokyo, others. So, rebirth. This brings me to maybe one of the most important projects I've ever touched on because I think about it often. Very often I'm asked, where was I on September 11th? You know, it's an obvious question. And how strange that after 12 years of living in Berlin, the Jewish Museum opened on September 11, 2001. It opened in the morning of that day. And by about 2.38 in the afternoon, 2.40 p.m. Berlin time, the Jewish Museum closed its doors. That was the attack on New York. How strange. And I thought of this. You know, there's a, there is a sonnet by Shakespeare that talks about anniversaries, the things that have a certain date that repeat, repeat themselves. So September 11th, opening of the Jewish Museum, and I turned to Nina and other people in, in the studio and I said, when I came to the office that morning, I said, you know, this is the first day I don't have to think about history because people will enter the museum. They, they can make a judgment of themselves about history. And yet, I realized how wrong I was. History is never over. It's, it's always continuing in ways we might not understand, but we have to, we have to be part of. And that's the moment I decided I'm returning to New York, I didn't say I'm returning to Manhattan or the Bronx. I said, I'm going to lower Manhattan. I had no idea what I was saying. But I was strange that I wound up there because I won the competition with the idea of how to rebuild Ground Zero. And I called it Memory Foundations because it is using the memory of that day to create the foundations for an incredible 21st century New York. And here's my early sketches. You know, you see the Statue of the Torch of Liberty, which inspired me to move the buildings away from the center, but put them on the periphery, to create a large memorial in the center, to, you, to create about half of the space uh, as public space, six, 16 acres. It's not a big space, but about eight acres is public space. And to use the underground, to, to, to pay homage to the bedrock at which people perished. And I want to tell you, there were seven finalists, all my colleagues and friends, famous architects, Everyone put buildings in the center, big buildings, one big building, two big buildings, mega structures. I said nothing should stand in the center. It should be an open place. It should be a place for people, a memorial, place that you can see New York in a new perspective. And yet, of course, we need fantastic buildings and accommodate the 10,000 square feet of, 10 million square feet of density, infrastructure necessary, cultural uh, uh, facilities necessary, visitor center, and so on. On the left is my sketch. First, you know, early sketch. On the right is one of the latest renderings of the project, and it's pretty close. Of course, it's a very difficult process because you have so many different stakeholders. You've got the families of the victims. And that's where I started. You know, I thought, that's, who, who's, who is my client? Of course, there's the governor of New York and governor of New Jersey who run the Port Authority, who leases the land to private investors and their architects. But what about the people, the, the mothers, daughters, sisters, brothers, uncles? of people who will forever be embedded and part of that site in New York. So how do you create a site which is balanced between memory, but a memory which should not shift New York into a pessimistic perspective, should on the contrary use that memory to reaffirm the values of America. So that's the Freedom Tower on the left, 1776. It's a symbolic height. It's, it's, I thought, you know, you can make a building of any height, but make it 1776, because when people look in the sky, it's not that it was the highest building in you know, 2012. It's that it will always stand for a date of the Declaration of Independence. And that date is unsurpassable, because it's the first document of human rights in the world. 
Nothing has beaten it. It's the first one. So yes, that's the sky of New York, the buildings by different architects, the memorial in the center, and my early models. Uh, of course, there are changes. And you have to be able to work with others uh, and, and compromise. Compromise is not a dirty word. That's why I'm a believer in democracy. You know, if somebody gave me an empty sign and said, just go and do it, I wouldn't be so happy. I like uh, the fact that, that in democracy people are involved. You don't have to agree with everything they say, but the process has to be transparent. And so there is the site. There is the, the, you know, and it's not only a site standing by itself. If you think about the site, how small it is, you think of the entire downtown of Denver could fit there. The entire downtown of Baltimore could fit there. That's how much density there is, how much infrastructure down below. So you have to think about it, not just of the small piece of lower Manhattan, but what is in it. It's a city in itself. And what is particularly important, I showed this diagram even to non-architects or non-planners, just a diagram. There are many levels below ground level. So the ground level is the easiest to see what is above. But we have 75 feet down to bedrock. And that's infrastructure. Path trains are running. Subways are running. Right from the first day, the path trains were running. You have to be able to construct everything with all this infrastructure. But I wanted one more thing. I wanted that the experience of the plaza, of the memorial, whatever it would be, and it's Michael Arad's beautiful Peter Walker's design, I wanted it to go all the way to bedrock. Now, that space wanted to be occupied by bus parking, by infrastructure. It's very expensive space. But I thought the least we could do to remember is to show that from the ground level and upwards, all the way to the foundations of the building, it's a sacred space, it's a special space. And indeed it is. That's the space where we saw that slurry wall. That we saw it during the attack, or right after the attack. And I have to tell you another little anecdote, because I was standing at one Liberty Plaza just across the street where the architects were meeting with Lower Manhattan Development Corporation and all the important engineers on a, on a sad November day. And it was raining, and somebody from the Port Authority said, does anyone here want to go down to the site? And no one said, everybody said, no, it's much better to see the site from here. Something drove me and Nina to say, I'd like to go down to the site. And I have to tell you, my life changed when we walked down that ramp. When you walk down that 75-foot ramp, and you touch the bedrock, and you are so deeply below New York, and you suddenly realize... What, what this attack was. It's not an attack that just murdered thousands of people. It's changed everything. You know, the way we see the world is different. The way we travel is different. The way we think of the future is different. So, and I touched this wall. I didn't even know what it was. And the engineer said, it's the slurry wall. You know, in all my years studying architecture, I didn't really, was not clear what it is. It's a huge dam. It's, it's very thick. It's, it's a dam. On the other side, on the left side is the Hudson River. If this wall had collapsed, that's a foundation of ground zero, the entire subway system of New York would have been flooded. So I thought, this, this, this is the experience. This is where people perish. This is America. This is also where people should be. And that's indeed part of, of the design. Uh, it's now part of the September 11th Museum, which I had the good luck to walk through by Davis Brody Bond. It's a fantastic space. It's, it's, it's going to haunt and inspire us because it's a vast museum which is oriented by this slurry wall where you understand where you are, where the things were. It's not an abstract virtual presentation. You're there in person, in the spirit. And uh, it, the museum itself is fantastic. It, it tells the stories. It, it has some of the artifacts, the, the burnt out uh, 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 fire truck, but it also tells story of human resilience, America, and, and, and fantastic people. You go through the visitor center where you have some of the remnants, and then of course you're at the at the memorial itself, which is quite spectacular because every name is etched. You can read it, and it was also my idea to bring the uh, waterfalls from the very beginning. Uh, I, I in my master plan I said there should be waterfalls, and I was highly criticized by the Post and Daily News. They thought, how crazy to have Niagara Falls in the middle of New York. But it works to screen the busy streets of New York, to have an intimate experience, to bring nature uh, back into New York, back to, to the experience of, of this memory, and to create something that is really for everyone. And it's a very visited site. Even though it's not yet part of the city structure, it is already visited by millions and millions of people. And the most inspiring, maybe you don't know this, there are three times the number of people living in Lower Manhattan today than when I started. 
It has become a magnet. There's schools opening. Families are moving in. It's not just Wall Street. It's a new, lively neighborhood, which is really the affirmation of life. And that's what it is about. I created also one more device, which was not in the program. It's called the Wedge of Light. I wanted to create a plaza, which is marked from Broadway, because so many people will come from Broadway. Between 8.46 a.m. when the first tower was struck, and 10.28 when the second tower collapsed. And it's, it's a plaza marked by... Uh, the tower number two edge and the center of the path terminal. It's a dramatic tribute in light, really, in the light of New York. And, of course, the building standing in the grid, but forming a, a torch-like figure. Uh, and you can see this is from our windows of our studio office, right? You know, I remember when we first came that it was nothing. It was sad. And, and you could see life. And that's also, that's what it is. It's about affirmation of life over these events, L victory of life over these terrorists. That's the project. It's already more than this photograph. And I end here where I began. You know, I was an immigrant, as I said, from Poland uh, to New York. And I was lucky enough to arrive by ship, one of the last immigration groups to come by ship, because later on it was cheaper to fly, you know, by airplane. But coming by ship, you know, being woken up early uh, by my mother, my sister, we're getting, get up, you're going to see New York. And there's nothing to prepare you really for, for the vista of New York. You know, if you see it from the sky, you kind of, okay. But if you arrive and you see truly, just like in the movies, I have to tell you, it's not a made-up sentimental story. The Statue of Liberty coming out of that dusk at 4.30 in the morning on the SS Constitution, by the way, America Holland Line, uh, you think you've arrived at something incredible. The, at the proof that America is the most incredible because it's a proof that people could do this without a military government, without kings, without dictators. And that's what America is about. That's what this project is about. It's about the value of, of America, not just of New York, of our country, of freedom, of liberty, of justice. Thank you.